Yo, and welcome to this presentation about reproducible builds. I think this is take 20 or something uh, at this point. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about reprodu what reproducible builds are, uh, what Arch has been doing in the past year in terms of reproducible builds, how it works and how you can contribute. Uh, so I'm Morten Lindru. Uh, I also go by the nickname of Foxboron on the internet. I work as a security engineer uh, as my day job, and uh, I've been sort of contributing to the Arch Linux distribution since 2017. I'm a trusted user, and I do a lot of package maintaining, such as a comp co-compiler, uh, i3 gaps, DVM, a lot of the container ecosystem uh, in terms of uh, Podman, Container, uh, LXD, um, all that jazz. Uh, I also contribute to the security team, doing uh, CVs, uh, security tracking, publishing advisories, and most importantly, uh, I do reproducible builds. So we're going to sort of work through how the supply chain in Arch Linux works, uh, how we do package building, uh, how what reproducible builds are, and how we, how it's sort of organized. We'll take a look at the current tooling we have for users, which, which we have been working on the past year. And then we'll talk a little bit how rebuilding works, and then lastly, about how you can contribute. I'll also try to do some live demos, uh, so we'll see how that goes. So, uh, the supply chain of Arch is essentially how we take the uh, pristine upstream code and deliver it uh, to point B, which is the users. And generally how we do that is that we track down the, the project repositories for the different projects. Uh, we do the integrity checks, which is the checksums, make sure nothing is corrupted uh, during download. And then we do uh, we take the signatures to have authenticated releases. So we know that someone did actually authenticate the release and there was nothing in between doing that. Next up, uh, there's the building part. Some people use uh, build servers, some people use uh, build on the local machines uh, using the tooling we provide. And then lastly, there's the signature step, which some people download artifacts to the laptop, some people have done everything on the laptop, and some people do uh, GPG forwarding. Once the packages have been uh, built, we upload them to Gemini, which is our tier zero mirror. And it's then distributed to tier one and the tier two mirrors, which then allows you to uh, download packages. And this is sort of like a few steps from point A to point B. It's not a singular step, it's a few more uh, different variables. But we generally uh, build everything in clean shroots uh, to have everything isolated from the main systems. That ensures we don't have dependencies which pollute uh, the build. We don't have environment variables that affects, affects the build, so on. Um, so in theory, nothing should uh, affect, affect the build. Uh, nothing should uh, change it, so to speak. So what are we trying to do? Um, so currently, I have built uh, Yesterday, I built uh, Pac-Man, uh, the last release we did. And this is the, essentially the last release that Alan did in, uh, in July, uh, releasing Pac-Man 5.2.2. Um, and we have so far uh, already built it. So what we're going to do is that we're just going to go ahead and build it a second time. In theory, it's all isolated from the rest of the system. There's nothing that should affect the build, right? There's no external dependencies or no environment variables. Let's take a look at how, how this goes. So now running through the tests of Pac-Man. Um, done this a few times now, it should it shouldn't fail, which would be very hilarious. Now we're doing the pack, uh, packaging step. Uh, we take all the man pages and the locals and stuff. 
and then you compress it into a package. Now we have some sanity checking tools on top. Um, so in theory, nothing should uh, be affecting the build, uh, nothing should have come between it, but still we see uh, two different checksums. So this is uh, this is a bit strange. What's what's the what's what's, what's the reasons reason for this uh, change? And if you use Diffoscope, which is essentially a tool um, that's created to check differences in um, tarballs, binary files, and stuff, you quickly see that um, uh, man pages uh, have embedded timestamps, uh, which changes the MD5 and uh, the SHA-256 digests. You also see that the um, uh, directories inside a package has different times. Um, so we're not completely isolated from the rest of the environment. Uh, so what reproducer builds are is essentially how we can ensure that the source code we take and the uh, binary artifacts we provide, uh, there's a verifiable path which nothing actually goes in and change. Uh, so this was started in Debian in 2014. Uh, it's currently headed by Holger Levson, which uh, contributes to Debian. And this currently have uh, quite a lot of stakeholders these days. Uh, Debian, OpenSUSE, uh, NixOS, GUIX, OpenVRT, and ArchLinux, of course, and a few other projects as well. Um, so on the art, uh, so the reproducer builds uh, provides monthly reports, um, which uh, provides sort of details the progress has been doing past uh, uh, the past month. On the arch team, we have Anthrax, Tiel, KPC, YD, Alan, and many, many, many other people um, that contributes to the project on the arch side of things. And generally, there there's a few. Um, People have been doing this for the past year. It started with Anthrax in 2007, no, 2005, 15, 16, I think. And later on, there's been more and more contributors from Arch, which has been invested in this. There's been several summits uh, since 2015. Uh, which has been going on in different places. Uh, Arch has been represented on all of them, I think. Um, and there's a GIF from the one that was held in Marrakesh in 2019. Sadly, there won't be any uh, summits this year, but it's, it's a productive thing where a bunch of people from different projects, different distributions, uh, discuss and try hack on different uh, issues within the reproducer build space. Uh, so the main goal is again, to sort of trust the, ver trust the packagers, but also be able to verify uh, the work they're doing. Um, not just blindly uh, look at me and go say, uh, yeah, I, I trust you package i3 gaps with this version using this source code, but you essentially have no way to verify. So why should you take my word for it? You should probably be able to check it yourself. So the reproducer builds uh, project defines um, the source state epoch, uh, which is essentially an environment variable that allows you to specify the timestamp of the build, um, which then can trickle down into the build system and make sure that sort of things that we saw earlier doesn't happen, that you always have the same timestamp on the directories that get, that get created. And then we also have the build and for file, and that's sort of a build of materials. Uh, it's supposed to denote all of the different things that go into the build. Uh, here we see the building for file that's used in, in Pacman. So it denotes the package names, package versions, the package architectures, the checksum of the package build and uh, the build date, build directory, and then all of the dependencies. Uh, this format is described in the man page, build info, build info. And I really encourage you to go um, check it out. So to provide user tooling, you have to sort of read this file to have a recreatable uh, environment. So we use the build date, the build directory, all of the install packages, which compression was used. Uh, most packages these days use C standard, uh, but there's still some left that use Xset. You also have to take the uh, packager uh, environment variable. 
And there's currently two tools uh, that allows us to utilize the building profile. Uh, it's Arch and it's Repro, um, which is a tool that's more of a, not only intended to be run on Arch, but also on other distributions. Uh, and then it's also supposed to abstract a little bit away from the nitty gritty details of how to fetch the package build files, uh, how to retrieve the, um, the, the sort of source files. And then you have make repro package, um, which is provided by DevTools. Uh, it uh, gives you, it's, it's more of a developer friendly tool, uh, which does not abstract away that many details, but it's uh, sort of easier to use in a development setting. So we have, um, so yes, we have the two different uh, Pac-Man files. Uh, so what we are going to do is that we're going to run two. Yes, so we're going to uh, go ahead and run repro on the first package that we used. Uh, so that's going to be building a second time. So we're, here we are sort of uh, reading the build file, fetching a bunch of packages from our package archive, uh, which is matched uh, to the build info installed um, values in the file. We'll go do a little bit of a dance to ensure that the environment is consistent, which involves installing packages two times, essentially once with just new packages and then reinstalling all the packages to make sure we have a consistent uh, environment. And then we're going to uh, go ahead and build uh, Pac-Man. Um, so now we're soon done setting up the environment. Now we're downloading Pac-Man. I'm also in this um, uh, this version not running the tests because uh, in Pac-Man, though, they do not affect the build. Uh, they shouldn't really affect the build, but sometimes they do. Uh, that's not the case in Pac-Man and in most packages, really. So it sort of uh, shortens down the build time. So now we're done. We're packaging up all the man pages, cleaning up after ourselves. And then it reports this as reproducible, but um, we can uh, just quickly compare them. I mean, now we see that uh, both of those packages has been uh, reproduced. Uh, it's identical. There's no differences in the file, and sort of that's the uh, intention of the of the tooling. So we have sort of been uh, rebuilding packages um, for a while. It's called the CI system. It's hosted by reproducedforbuilds.org. Um, it's been going for soon, I think two three years now, um, but. Uh, it's be called the CI because it doesn't actually take distributed packages and then tries to find upstream bugs. Uh, doesn't try to find uh, flaws in the distributed ones. It only takes checks out the source files, compiles it two two times in different environment settings to sort of fuss out any bugs in upstream. So it's uh, it's it's more of a theoretical value than than a practical one. What we did, however, we get this year was. Uh, rebuilder from keep CYRD uh, and it's uh, sort of a distributed uh, CI CD system which uses repro and then archive packages uh, which we are the ones we are distributing currently um, it has three nodes currently which runs on our infrastructure and currently runs uh, one of them runs on the bin just for fun um, so this isn't only checking out the source files it's also uh, testing out the actual uh, distributed packages. Uh, so the comparison on those two is that uh, the CI has it's the three uh, percent reproducible packages, extra has eighty five percent, and then community has seventy seven percent. That's the graph which is published, and you see it sort of failed a bit in the summer, and then we fixed it up uh, sort of recently, and it's been chugging away nicely. The rebuilder setup, however, has a uh, slightly better results overall. Um, that's because we are not uh, taking the taking the sort of changing values, which which we normally do not change at all. So core is at ninety four point four percent, extras at ninety percent, and then community at seventy eight point six percent. And this is uh, 
actual reproducible packages today. Um, and that's sort of nice. We're not completely 100%. It will take a while before we are at 100%, but we're sort of getting very close. And that's that's fun. So, um, no. so we'll take a look at uh, how to actually reproduce packages. Um, so I have a package. Uh, so sort of one of the important packages in Arch Linux is the keyring, which contains all of the package signing keys from Arch. Um, so uh, actually I can show. So this is the keyring. Uh, so this is the keyring I have installed. I'm fetching it from my uh, package cache. So we'll actually just go ahead and reproduce this package. Um, So again, we're now doing the same dance we did uh, last time. We've been getting all the packages, recreating the environment, and then um, actually taking a distributed package and um, going to reproduce it identical. It has a few less dependencies than Pacman, so it's easier to, or it's not easier, but it's faster to reproduce than uh, what Pacman does. Now we're doing the second dance again. And then we're heading over to the building part of, um, of Repro. Fetching the sources. Um, now we already built it, cleaning up after ourselves. And this, you see it's uh, reproducible. Um, so what I'm just going to quickly do right now. So we have that package and then we have Five, six, some. Yes. Um, it's not the. Uh, just do that and that. And you see that now we have the same checksum. Uh, so we have now actually uh, reproduced an actual package um, that Arch distributes. So um, what's the currently the unproducible package? Uh, so we care a lot about core because it's uh, sort of the central packages um, and it's, it should sort of have a high standard and stuff. Uh, and there's a few packages. Um, most of the Linux kernels is not reproducible because of different issues I'll get into. I think we're trying to reproduce GCC ADA as I'm talk, recording this talk now. And there's still like a few packages with different issues. The problem is that they're complicated, uh, sort of legacy, not well, legacy uh, build systems that's hard to navigate. So it's qu there's still quite a lot of effort left. It should be noted that um, the tooling that you see here is still experimental. Uh, things can change. Uh, we can e encounter new issues in Pac-Man, in the repro, um, in the CI or the rebuild step. So if something turns um, unreproducible tomorrow, it doesn't necessarily mean that uh, something bad has happened. We have issues with like the private keys generation in Linux, uh, where we do uh, we generate a set of keys to uh, sign modules, but these keys are gen are sort of uniquely created for each package, and that implies that the package by default is not reproducible. And that's more of a uh, package issue, more so than a uh, sort of a upstream issue. It's more how you separate them. You also have uh, things like the path being embedded multiple times, depending how you source the files, um, and that. Um, was a reason by that we also discovered that made most of the Haskell packages unreproducible. This has been fixed recently, so if you see the append path problem that some people have has been having, uh, that served the same issues. Uh, we also have uh, the Python hash seed, um, which is essentially a problem where the generated bytes code from uh, from the Python compiler is not deterministic, so it will try and randomize the keys in dictionaries. Um, and object tables and all of those stuff. Um, and 
uh, it makes a package uh, for us and reproducible um, in Debian they're separated out and then generated at at installation but we sort of bundle all of that together and there's still uh, general packaging issues in Arch but there's still a few issues which are not <laughs> um, uh, related to Arch so a uh, sort of a common thing that uh, packages does is to get patches and one of the th few th ways you can get package, uh, patches is to just um, find the upstream repository, find the commit hash, and just add path uh, at the end of the URL. And it will give you a nice deformated path uh, patch uh, out of it. The problem is that um, we recently discovered, or well, we sort of discovered that in GitLab, these patches are not reproducible. Because I'm not sure if you actually see the issue uh, in, the path, uh, in, the, in the patch but the git version is actually embedded in the, uh, in the, in the patch there. And that means that whenever uh, GitLab, the, like the main uh, GitLab servers update their, their git version, the patch will have a checksum that changes uh, accordingly. And that's uh, sort of one way it's a reproducibility issue to its uh, problem where uh, integrity checks fail over time. So that was uh, fixed by a few helpful people in the Arch Linux Reproducible channel. And currently this is not uh, an issue uh, on the live servers. But it's still a, a demonstration how uh, there's not only uh, packaging issues, but also sort of upstream issues that can affect the build. So ways to contribute to reproducible builds is to try find your favorite software, let's try to reproduce it. Doesn't, it doesn't reproduce and try to figure out the flaws. Uh, the reproducibuilds.org has a lot of documentation, comments, and information that you can use um, to uh, sort of uh, figure out how to solve these issues. Um, you can also sort of uh, work your way through um, uh, packages. Uh, so I built um, this package earlier today. Uh, so what we're going to do is that we're going to reproduce it. Uh, be release. Yes, um, so what this does is that it reads the uh, package build file in the current directory. It runs default scope and then we take the uh, package in the current directory. Um, so uh, what you should do now is that you should just try to reproduce it with the files we have checked out. And then we're just going to uh, try to see if we have a similar package from the one we built earlier today. So again, we're setting up the environment. Reinstalling the packages twice. Now we're doing the build. So what we're hopefully going to see is that the package is not reproducible. Um, and what the changes we're actually going to see is that uh, uh, the gzip compressed uh, man page has a timestamp embedded into it, um, which again changes the checksum of the of the man page and then gives us a different result. Um, so in this case, I've actually made the package reproduce, uh, unreproducible. Uh, it has been fixed. Uh, so I conveniently uh, removed the make man page reproducible patch. So if we take a look at this uh, patch, uh, we see that um, uh, it appends the dash n switch to gzip, which makes the uh, package uh, man page reproducible, and then we also uh, make sure that uh, some embedded timestamp uh, in help to man is also uh, adhering to source state epoch. Uh, with, and with all of these changes, uh, we'll now just uh, create a package from scratch. That doesn't take a lot of time, and then we rerun the uh, com same command we used earlier. Now we also see that uh, there's some um, quickly some package updates. 
Now we're uh, again reproducing the package. So now we're installing all the packages again to make a consistent environment. And deleting, deleting the snapshot cleaning off after ourselves. And the package is reproducible. So we can also prove that by running uh, LSP release that package and then the build package. And it's the same checksum. And that's sort of how you'd go about um, making Arch packages reproducible uh, and sort of help. Uh, so, so if you're interested in this, this, these things, uh, you have the Arch is reproducible on Freenode, and you also have the reproducible build channel at the OFTC. Uh, we're soon starting weekly meetings again, and then you can um, hear about the progress that's being made in the project and in all of the other stakeholder projects. Um, this was my presentation. Uh, you can find me on almost any IRC network as Foxbaron. I have a web page and a blog. I'm on GitHub, of course, and I also have Twitter. If you have questions about this talk in the future or uh, in general, you can send me an email uh, or you can come to me on IRC. And I hope uh, it was an interesting talk. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks for a fantastic talk, Fox. Uh, my name's Secret. I will be your question host. Yes. Um, <laughs> so the very first question is, why do man pages need a timestamp uh, from uh, last? So I, I think it's a legacy thing. Um, and it's sort of nice to know when the, when the man pages were uh, built in terms of the package, but uh, it's also a legacy thing. And the many, many build systems does not account for it. Uh, so it's a bit of annoyance, but uh, it's a little bit handy, I think. OK. Um, how are these two environments set up? What are you using to keep them isolated from each other and the host, again, from list? Yes. Um, so when we build all our packages, it's everything is just system D and spawn, which just builds the, uh, builds the container. And we just uh, insert the base packages needed for building. Uh, and then you do the same make package dash s process that you're familiar with uh, from AOR helpers and stuff. And then uh, that's mostly it. So we sort of have a root container prepared with all the base packages, and then we clone it and do the package uh, building in that one. So whenever you do multiple builds, they'll always be from the same root container. Um, yes. Right. Um, Eval asks, how are you sure about clean environments, package dependencies, et cetera? So I sort of, ex I think that's uh, part of the, if I understand it correctly, it's part of the, the, the DB scripts portion of uploading. So we can essentially go peek at the build info file uh, and you can just read the list of install packages and you can ease, very easily spot when there's AUR packages in the install file or if there's, um, uh some of your own built packages which slash git prefix which is present in the build file uh build info file and then you know that uh this is not a clean build and it's post possibly being polluted uh by some external right. stuff okay cool um steam asks how realistic is a 100 percent, i guess 100 percent reproducibility in core and extra and what is the minimum percentage you're aiming for across all repos? Um, so if you consider the fact that uh, Linux, for instance, uh, embeds uh, sign, uh, signing keys for modules, we can't have a uh, hundred percent uh, reproducible core. We can however have uh, all expected packages reproducible and then some packages that we expect are not reproducible which means that if we fix the packaging of Linux, we can sort of split out the signing keys and have Linux reproducible, and then one Linux uh, split package, which is, which is not going to be reproducible, but we sort of know that. Uh, so 100%, probably not realistic, but we can then consider some blacklisted packages and then um, 
um, have rest of it reproducible to 100% theoretically. Right. And so there's no minimum percentage you're kind of aiming for. It's just what well, we want 100%, you can achieve. <laughs> which is <laughs> just kind of it. packaging real yeah, quick. Yeah. It's, it's just a bit more annoying, I think. <laughs> Orhan asked, which terminal and shell is this? Uh, so the terminal is Termite, uh, which is maintained by Yella uh, and, Arch, uh, and Arch Dev and was written by David uh, McKay, which was an Arch Linux team. Uh, and the, what, uh, the s s shell is C shell and uh, I just added to the prompt to make some sense for the demos. Yes. <laughs> yes, stream specific, that's it. Uh, the next question is from me, uh, Secret. Uh, are there security implications in making packages reproducible, i.e. losing randomization in hash maps, um, <laughs> yeah, things like that? So uh, the, the, I, I, uh, it's sort of, I think it depends a little bit because the naive uh, answer to this is probably yes, you will be losing a little bit of, of, of security because you sort of have to uh, split out signing keys. You can't maybe have static signing keys and stuff. Um, but I, th I think on, on overall, the, the sort of the security you lose is not that, uh, that important in contrast to the sort of the supply chain integrity that you gain from it. Um, right. And if you have some block list packages or some package you don't expect to be reproducible, you can sort of get away with a lot of the worse um, reproducibility issues. Uh, in terms of the Python hash seed, uh, that's that's originally done to prevent DOS attacks on... on... Yeah, do, do you want me to read that? Because that's like a follow-up question. Oh, okay, yeah, sure. Yeah. <laughs> uh, KGZ asks, the reason for the Python hash seed being randomized by default was to prevent hash clip hash colors and denial of service attacks. Mm -hmm. Is there another mitigation for that? Or was that a trade-off in favor for reproducible yeah. builds? So that's basically exactly like kind of the, the same sphere, right? So um, I, I, I do not recall uh, the, um, the justification offhand uh, for the hash seed. Uh, I think this is mainly a problem for uh, when it's a security implication that, that hash collisions is a thing. Uh, but for most uh, library packages and Python applications on Arch, that's I don't think that's going to be a, a huge issue. Uh, it's mostly on the sort of your production facing deployment builds where that might be a security implication. Yeah. So I, I think there's a trade off here between use, user packages and then production packages, um, essentially. Okay, cool. Um, Kat Yefel asks, uh, sorry, I forgot your name wrong. Uh, when the build fails, do you chug the rest of the beer? That would be a hilarious drinking game, but uh, not currently. I think it's the other way around. When you chug the rest of the beer, the build fails. Oh, oh that's going to be a hard one. <laughs> um, uh, Ebal asks, do these, do these patches make any sense to provide upstream? Uh, so we actually publish a lot of these patches upstream. Um, Open SUSE with uh, Bernard uh, Weiderman, Wilderman Weiderman, I forget his last name. Uh, he publish, he does a lot of patching upstream to fix these issues, but it's it's sort of natural that these patches get applied to the build package first, and then we verify it works, and then we usually upstream all the patches. And that's sort of a recurring theme in a lot of uh, Arch packaging is to just uh, we patch something, then we submit it upstream as well. Uh, so uh, most of this hits upstream sooner or later. It has been, some of these has been uh, given to upstream, but they might not have been pulled yet in the release. So right. Can you give any patching. examples of those that you, you have upstreamed? Oh, I have done probably 20, 30 patches upstream to Go projects. A lot of the container ecosystem, uh, Podman, uh, container or like a lot of those projects personally, uh, but like uh, we have done G glibc patches, Pacman has gotten patches uh, uh, and stuff. So it's uh, quite a few, but I don't forget it. Um, the reproducible builds uh, monthly report actually has a list of all the patches that are submitted and fixed upstream. Um, so you can actually keep tabs on how many patches land upstream and what is currently being worked on to get upstream. Awesome. Uh, do you have any way to provide exceptions to reproducibility? For instance, when you don't want to patch out timestamps? Uh, 
Uh, we don't. Uh, we can probably blacklist packages in our rebuilder setup, but we we currently don't have any formalized uh, way of right. doing that currently. It's it's so so by blacklist you mean it won't even attempt to to try to yeah to like or... uh, so our current rebuilder system uses three nodes, but none of them are like super powerful. So if you try build TensorFlow, uh, which is which takes ten hours to build, uh, that's <laughs> that's that's simple and reasonable. So that package, for instance, is uh, blocked from being rebuilt on on I our see. rebuilder system because it would just totally kill a few servers for a day or more uh, to try to reproduce it. And you can sort of assume it's not reproducible. Cool. Um, so that that question was asked by A. Bowman. I forgot mm. to read the name. Um, DVZRV David asks, mm. comparing large container files, e.g. installation images using Diffiscope, is currently an issue. Crashes. How does this currently impact? large packages, e.g. game data? So I think both the Linux documentation and the Linux package is hard to debug because uh, Diffoscope does not like to uh, produce the diffs for them because there's a lot of um, both binaries, binary files that need a diff, and there's a lot of uh, different resources. So I think running Diffoscope on that takes quite a while and sometimes crashes. Uh, I think that's part of an optimization thing. I'm not sure how Upstream does about that. Um, hopefully getting fixed because it's a little bit huge issue on, on larger packages at least, but it works really well on small ones. Nice. Uh, KGZ asked, what's the end game for reproducible builds in Arch? If a package starts being reproducible, how can you block all new uploads that don't reproduce? Uh, so I think uh, the end game is to have, have this integrated more deeply into the sort of package upload. Um, where, but, but so you actually, if it's unreproducible, it won't be published to users, uh, or at the very least, uh, you, you should decide to say you don't want the package. Uh, but considering a rolling release system and library updates, it's 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 a bit hard. Um, but I think the end goal is to try have reproducible builds, uh, or well, unreproducible packages imply that you can't upload the package. But we are currently right. a long way away from that. I mean, I guess that also kind of introduces an issue with regards to receiving security updates. If a security update yeah. that's needed for a package doesn't, it breaks reproducibility, you have to make the call for... Oh, that's, that's <laughs> a tough one. I'll, I'll let uh, Anthrax think about that one for, uh, for a little while. <laughs> oh. <Yeah. laughs> uh, Ramsey asks, are there any guards that prevent a reproducible package that could not be reproduced from... Yeah, so that's, I guess, the same... Uh, that could be, not be reproduced from entering the repo. Can just I'll just read so, the question. Uh, so yeah, oh, yeah, it's essentially the, the same thing. And like, what happens if um, if a previously reproducible package becomes unreproducible? Yeah. So of course we want it to to uh, to be a thing, but but it's we're very uh, far away from actually uh, having having this guard in place. Uh, it, it would be very fun to have it though, and I think it'd be a big improvement on the current current packaging and supply chain of Arch. Okay. Uh, Stefan OXC asks, or zero XC, mm. a few packages in Arch Linux are not built from source, but just repackaged binaries from upstream. Do you think the packaging guidelines will change if reproducible builds become more important in the future, as Anthrax has said? Um, so that is a problem that we you do it. I think we do it on some Java packages because the alternative is extremely tedious. Um, there's probably also some legacy packages that has been doing that for years and nobody has bothered to unpack it, but that, that's, that's, uh, that's not necessarily a reproducible builds issue. It's a general packaging quality issue and we do fix it. There are bug reports on several of them and uh, a lot of that should be fixed, honestly, um, both for, in terms of reproducible builds and also for the general package quality, uh, of Arch packages. Uh, so there are some, hopefully we'll fix them. Please send patches. <laughs> patches welcome. Yes, patches welcome. Uh, there's <laughs> a lot of Java stuff that's, that's very tedious to to get correctly. It's uh, it's, it's it's a bit bad. Uh, Dawnimator? Downimator asks, uh, where can I see slash get updates on if packages I maintain are reproducible? 
Oh, uh, we have an internal dashboard. Uh, I can't show you that one. I think Yelle can give you a link if he hasn't already done that. But there's an internal dashboard that on ArchWeb uh, for packagers uh, that enables you to see unreproducible packages. Um, but currently, it's only internal, and the public can see it. So I've shown it, but I can link you off to, afterwards. Awesome. Sorry, I apologize if people can hear church bells in the background. Um, and finally, yeah, this is the last question. Uh, U1106 asks, so if one of your dependencies or your source were polluted, how would you notice that? You build twice using the same polluted thing, and there, perfect match. So I guess that's a question about generally having poisoned upstream packages. Um, so if we if we go a bit academic on this one, uh, so that's called the trusting trust attack, uh, and it's sort of it's uh, uh, it's the one uh, can uh, can can it no Ken Ritchie Ken Thompson Ken yeah I think it's Ken Thompson fuck I forgot the, the, the name <laughs> it's of Ken it. Thompson yeah. uh, yes Ken Thompson uh, trusting trust attack uh, and it sort of devolves that how can you trust your compiler is actually outputting uh, the correct binaries and the question for that is that we can't uh, this is partially solved by uh, di diverse double compilation which is uh, which is sort of explained by David A Wheeler's uh, academic thesis. Uh, but uh, this is more akin to the bootstrap ability issue of, of packaging and not that much of reproducibility. So we can't uh, detect polluted dependencies, um, but we hopefully in the future, after reproducible builds, have uh, some form of bootstrappable builds where we can uh, bootstrap all of the dependencies and then also provide uh, some confirmation of the package. That is being worked on, but it's admittedly a bit younger field than, um, than reproducible builds. Uh, during Marrakesh in 2019, uh, using the MESS C compiler, uh, we managed to reproduce uh, GCC, uh, the same version across several distributions using different GCC compilers, and we wound up with the same checksum. So oh, wow. that's uh, um, that's a huge improvement on the on the on the on the ecosystem, and um, I think it's uh, it's a nice improvement on what we currently have. Uh, it's obviously just GCC, but if we can do that to GCC, hopefully we can then. Uh, continue onwards with other compiler and other languages, um, but it's still being worked on um, and stuff. I don't think that GCC compiler was actually reproducible in in Arch, but it was across Debian, GUIX, MixOS, and a few others. Um, I don't quite remember the details. Awesome. That is the uh, the end of the question. So I, I guess I'm gonna I'm gonna ask one more. Okay. Um, sure. What, what got what got you interested in in reproducible builds as a, as a thing? How did uh, How did you get dragged into all this, Fox? Uh, so all of this is accidental. Uh, this is this is me. Uh, I met Anthrax, Yella Shibumi, and Remy Kogogin uh, at CCC in 2016, and then they introduced me to the security team, which all of those also worked on reproducible builds. So they introduced me to that mind blowing concept of. If you build twice, do you get the same checksum? And you realize, no, you don't. And that sort of just spiraled uh, to sort of this presentation three years so, afterwards. So Arch, the Arch security team has been working on reproducible builds for it's, at least as far back as winter 2016. Yes, uh, it's mostly the same people. It's, it's mostly Anthrax that has sort of been uh, the driving force and been pushing forward to this and get all the, got all the people interested um, along with Alan and stuff. So. Yeah, it's been it's been quite a few years now, actually. Well, that's, that's yeah, fun. that's really cool. I know it's a, it's a subject that's fairly close to close to my interest, so I look forward to seeing seeing it develop as time goes on. Yes, and I'm sure it will. Awesome. There's, yeah, that's. Uh... I think there's another question. <laughs> oh yeah, sorry, there is one more oh. question now. Um, <laughs> what are your hobbies other than Arch Linux and reproducible builds by Bullsock? Uh do I have other hobbies and Arch Linux and reproducible builds? Oh, no, uh, drinking beer. I, I love beer. I, I enjoy Fostum going to Belgium and drinking more beer, uh, obviously. Uh, I do I enjoy music, uh, guitar. So I have a, a lot of guitars, uh, a lot of open source development and stuff, but it's it's mostly free software focused, most of my hobbies, really. I do enjoy traveling and photography, though. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you very much. Yes. Um, awesome. <laughs> yes. 
Cool. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you.